I'm very excited to be here. Uh, I'm going to uh, be talking through some ideas uh, that are actually a part of a forthcoming book, uh, my second book uh, called The AI Mirror, which will be out uh, early next year from Oxford University Press. But uh, I want to kind of preface this by saying that the talk and the book is intended to be a challenge and a confrontation. Uh, and I'm hoping to uh, get a reaction that will stimulate some great discussion after the talk. I'm a philosopher. I argue with people for a living. Uh, I chose that line of work, so I'm not afraid of questions that challenge some of the assertions or suggestions that I'm going to make. Uh, so don't be afraid when, uh, uh, when the time comes to push back. I'm going to speak to some familiar topics in AI ethics, machine learning fairness and bias, transparency and accountability, issues of safety, reliability, existential risk. But I'm not going to give the sort of standard, oh, here's what these things are talk. I don't know how familiar all of you are with those issues, but I'm happy during the Q&A to answer kind of more straightforward questions about those topics if you like. But I'm trying to do something a little bit more challenging here. Uh, and I'm trying to kind of reframe how we think about what AI technologies are and how we relate to them as human beings. So there's this bigger question about how AI relates to human potential, to human values, to human identity, and even how it changes these things. Because we don't just design and change and engineer technologies, they also reshape, re-engineer us. And that's been the case since we climbed down from the trees, right? We are who we are today in large part because of our technologies and the ways that they have reshaped and enabled us. And that will be true for AI as well. So this talk brings those larger humane concerns together with the kind of familiar ethical uh, questions that are matters uh, both for technical uh, experts uh, and also for ethicists, regulators, and others who are trying to govern these systems responsibly. Okay. So first of all, the book is called the AI mirror, but really all technologies are mirrors. Here, mirror, mirror is a metaphor, right? There are parallels between the concept of a mirror and what technologies do. So all technologies are extensions of human values and human imagination into the built and engineered world. Every technology from the wheel, to the book, to the engine, to the computer, reflects what humans at certain times and places thought was worth doing, worth making, worth enabling, or worth trying. So all technologies are mirrors of human values, human goals, human needs, human intentions. So we often kind of hear these strange um, bifurcated claims about technology versus humanity or technology and society as if those are different things, right? AI is already part of society. It always has been. Science and engineering are part of society. Computer science is part of society. It doesn't exist outside of that. All these things are also obviously human, right? So trying to say, well, AI versus human or AI versus society makes no sense at all. And the fact that we're framing it this way is an indication of how far our thoughts have drifted from where they need to be to understand our relationship with these technologies. So AI technologies are mirrors, but AI are particularly powerful mirrors, powerful in ways that previous technologies have not been. So let's take this analogy of the mirror a little bit further. Um, think about a mirror, if you know how mirrors are made, right? You, they have a surface that has to be polished in order to reflect light. 
think about the algorithms that drive machine learning models as the surfaces of the AI mirrors, right? It's the properties of those algorithms that determine the capabilities of the mirror at least partially so, in the same way that it's the properties of a glass surface and how it has been polished and the extent to which it distorts or not, right? The curvature of the mirror, that affects the capabilities of the mirror. Sometimes we want mirrors to be flat plane, sometimes we need mirrors to be curved, right? So this parallel might help you. Okay, now think about the uh, trained machine learning model with its outputs its predictions, its classifications, its depictions, as the images that appear on the mirror when we expose it to what? Okay, what do we need to expose a mirror to in order to get an image? Light. So what are we exposing to the AI mirrors? Data, right? So the incident light on the AI mirror everything that it reflects back to us comes from our own data. Okay, so I've said that these technologies are particularly powerful, these mirrors are particularly powerful, and that's especially true now, of course, right? So in a few short years, we've made massive leaps forward by constructing ever larger AI mirrors like GPT-4 or soon Google Gemini, that gather virtually all the light, all the human generated data that we possess in digital form. It's kind of the, similar to the era uh, when we built the uh, Hubble te telescope. I'm old enough to remember when the Hubble telescope was a new thing. The first time we could put massive mirrors in space and the engineering feats that were involved in constructing mirrors that large. And then the capabilities that it gave us to see not only further into the universe spatially, but back in time and to learn more about our world that way. So the kinds of AI mirrors that we're building now, the incredibly large, powerful mirrors that have emerged in the past few years are comparable to that era in uh, cosmology and, uh, uh, and the way that it was enabled by these new mirrors. From this light, all this digital light, our AI mirrors are now projecting an eerily lifelike and animated image of humanity. Although it really isn't humanity, is it? Because what does that incident light reflect? Does it reflect all of us? Does our data reflect all of us? Does it depict every human? No, we know that's not true, right? Most of the data reflects that small subset of English speaking and digitally connected humanity that is most represented in the digital corpus of the internet and the other data sets that we possess. We know that this data represents only a very small slice and a very particular slice of the human family. And that means that the image that's being reflected in these mirrors is not in fact an image of humanity as a whole. And that's, perhaps the first ethical point of importance for you to recognize as machine learning researchers or developers, right? That you don't have all the light and that the light you have to shine on your mirrors is not going to reflect everyone that these mirrors will uh, be designed to serve. And we already see what happens when we forget that. Most of the problems we have um, with algorithmic fairness and bias are as a result of forgetting that particular fact. There's another sort of uh, danger that um, I think is important to think about. How many of you are familiar uh, with Ovid's, uh, the Roman poet Ovid's Metamorphoses and uh, the story of Narcissus? Good, outstanding. All right, so uh, if you aren't familiar with the story, Narcissus is this beautiful young boy a uh, little bit on the vain side, uh, catch a sight of himself in a still uh, lake or pond, a reflecting pool, and believes that actually it's another young, beautiful boy in the lake. And he becomes captivated by his own image and he won't leave 
the side of the pool, the lake. He just keeps talking to and trying to get this beautiful boy in the mirror, right? The mirror of this water to respond to him. He ends up dying, by the way, there at the side of the pool because he can't tear himself away from his own beauty. So it doesn't end well for him. Ovid says he loves a bodiless dream. He thinks that a body that is only a shadow. You have a sense of where I might be going with this. O Ovid is pointing out that Narcissus, in taking a reflection for an embodied self, loses his own self, loses care for his own body and his own life and his obsession. He says, what Narcissus has seen, he does not understand, but what he sees, he is on fire for. I think we're at a point where we need to ask ourselves if we can avoid the same fate when it comes to looking in our AI mirrors, right? We gaze into these mirrors and it can be very difficult to understand that we're seeing our own reflection instead of seeing some new alien mind or sort of supernatural uh, 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 personhood that we've created, right? There's this weird sort of theological myth that we're telling ourselves that we are sort of creating our own gods and that these uh, descendants of ours in the mirror who speak to us through portals like chat GPT are sort of minds living on the other side. That's like Narcissus talking to himself in the pool, okay? Now, just to put this out there, I am not someone who believes that in principle, you can't create artificial consciousness or artificial minds. I think that's a fascinating area of research. I don't think the tools we're building now are anything like what we would need in order to build artificial minds. Happy to discuss that during the Q&A, okay? So what I'm worried about is mistaking the reflections of ourselves in the mirror or the reflections of at least a, a selection of ourselves in the mirror for beings that we have moral obligations to, for beings uh, that we should defer uh, our authority and agency to, beings that we should surrender our hopes to. That terrifies me. So I think we are in danger of becoming ourselves the postmodern narcissus. Okay, so that's the opening framing. Let's dive in uh, to some other thoughts. What do mirrors do? They reveal things. And that's primarily what we use them for. That's what we're aiming for, right? AI mirrors can reflect more than our words and voices. They can reflect our faces, our bodies, our decisions. And they can reveal more about these than we've been able to see by other methods. In particular, these tools are revealing patterns that recur in our data, which may in turn reflect important, subtle, and never before noticed patterns in our own lives and bodies. So for example, this is why we're so excited about applications like AI tools that might give us new paths for cancer diagnosis. That is, that might be able to notice subtle patterns in our bodies that we have not been able to discover by other means that might alert us to life-threatening diseases in time to save one another. Remember that ethics isn't just about what we shouldn't do, it's also about what we should do, right? And so the power of AI is also about identifying some of the things that we ought to try to reveal more fully to ourselves and one another. AI can reveal a lot of other things besides precursors of cancer. AI can reveal patterns of unjust discrimination in systems of justice, patterns of crop disease in a climate stressed ecosystem, patterns of corruption in a body of financial transactions. 
And of course, AI is being used for all of these applications and many more. But it's important to realize that mirrors don't just reveal, they magnify. That's both a benefit and a danger. Like glass mirrors, our algorithms are never neutral. They are never perfectly flat and polished surfaces. All mirrors and all AI tools magnify select features of our reality while diminishing or blocking our view of others. And when used or designed without care for that property, AI tools therefore not only reproduce, but amplify by magnifying power, right? They amplify many of the pervasive harms that already exist in our communities. And this is why one of the biggest problems to occupy many machine learning researchers and AI adopters over the past five years is the problem of algorithmic injustice and unfairness. Okay, so this is a study uh, from 2019 uh, led by some researchers at UC Berkeley uh, and some other institutions who discovered that a widely used algorithm in US hospitals that was designed to identify people at highest risk in a ho hospital setting who needed allocation of more clinical attention and more diagnostic resources, right? So you've got people in a hospital. There are some people that are just more likely to take a bad turn. You wanna be watching them more carefully. You wanna be giving them more tests, right? So it was an algorithm designed to find that subset of hospitalized patients who might be more clinically vulnerable. That's AI for good if anything is, right? Okay, but what did it actually end up doing? It ended up taking the sickest black patients in the hospital and deprioritizing them for care and elevating white patients who were in fact less clinically vulnerable and pushing them up in the queue for resources. So it did exactly the opposite of what we wanted it to do and in a way that was racially biased. It shouldn't surprise you if you know anything about the mechanisms of algorithmic bias that race was not a label in the data set. So how did this algorithm manage to magically not only replicate, but amplify medical neglect of black patients in America? The training data, but what about the training data? Not just the training data, also the surface of the mirror, the algorithm because the algorithm had to identify variables that would be good proxies for future healthcare need, right? How sick is someone likely to be? How much uh, resource do they likely need? So the developers of this algorithm chose as a proxy for that, what must have seemed to them a quite straightforwardly adequate proxy, namely cost. How much money should we predict will be spent on this patient? If we have records that tell us that patients like this historically have these many healthcare dollars spent on their care, then that's a good proxy for how much healthcare they've needed, right? Right? No. Not if you know anything about the American healthcare system which is that it is historically and comprehensively biased already against black patients. So black patients historically, here's, here's the way it works, right? If I go to the doctor and I present these 10 symptoms and describe them in this way, I will have X number of dollars spent on various tests that will be ordered for me, follow-ups, right, future visits. A black woman who goes into her doctor with exactly the same presentation of symptoms described in exactly the same way will receive maybe half as many follow-up visits. If any, she will have far fewer tests ordered for her and those tests will be far less costly, right? That doctor will spend less on her than they will on me, despite our having the same clinical presentation. 
That has nothing to do with AI. That's just how it is in the American healthcare system. And we haven't fixed that. But what did this algorithm do? It found that correlation. It found that pattern. And it said, aha, all right. OK, let's magnify that. What do you get if you naively train a predictive AI model on an unjust medical system? you get an AI tool that calculates how to be even more efficient at delivering injustice than people have been. And that's exactly what this algorithm did. And this is just one example in countless stories, right? Where dangerous, violent, deceptive, and manipulative patterns that run through human history and therefore run through our data are found and magnified by AI algorithms. There is a silver lining to this, actually, though. You can turn this power of magnification around. These same researchers did a later study that used machine learning to analyze images of knees. Knees. Why? Well, there's this weird thing um, that radiologists uh, have sort of not been able to figure out, which is that um, Black patients uh, complain often of higher degrees of knee pain relative to what the clinical findings uh, are that appear in the radiology reports. So when radiologists look at their x-rays or MRIs, right, they rate the damage. And the damage is always uh, uh, disproportionate to the amount of pain that's reported by Black patients. Now, what normally happens in the American healthcare system is that the radiologists just ignore that. They ignore the, the pain complaints and say, well, look, I don't know what to tell you, but I'm looking at your scan and it doesn't look that bad, right? So black patients' knee pain uh, gets neglected relative to white patients. And it's justified by the radiologist saying, hey, I'm not seeing anything on your scan. And of course, the inference is, oh, it must be that Black patients are complaining more, right? Or they're more sensitive to, uh, to pain or something. These researchers used a machine learning algorithm to see if it could detect and classify differences in those medical images such that it could identify the ones that actually were associated with higher pain reports from Black patients. Guess what? It did. The algorithm could see what the radiologists couldn't or wouldn't see. We don't quite know the full explanation for this. So the algorithm was actually able to say, no, these patients are describing something real, right? There's something there in these images. And now the radiologists are forced to look at that evidence and say, ah, oh, we're missing something. We need to go back and figure out what it is we're not seeing that these machine learning tools can see about what's going on in the knees of Black American patients. So we can use AI tools to identify and rectify biases and injustices, not just to replicate them, but we have to be trying to do that, right? Mirrors also distort, right? We know this. Certain features in a data set will be centered, intensified, and enlarged, while others are allowed to recede into invisibility. The distortions can be subtle or they can be stark. But in either case, these distortions can sometimes create a disturbing feedback loop. Um, I want you to think back to the hospital algorithm, the first one. So one of the things that it was doing, of course, was pushing care away from Black American patients. But that meant that even less would be spent on them than had been spent before. So any future versions of that algorithm or others that were trained on updated data would actually even further deprioritize Black patients for care because even less would have been spent on them because of the original algorithm, right? So it actually would become a vicious cycle or a feedback loop that's bleeding out into real world effects. Uh, we see the same thing with policing algorithms. Uh, if the policing algorithms are trained on biased data and then they send police out to already over-policed neighborhoods, the way it works is if you go to minoritized 
or immigrant neighborhoods expecting to find crime because an algorithm told you it's there, you're going to find something. You're going to make arrests, right? Because otherwise, it looks bad that you went out there and found nothing. So now you've got more arrests in the data for those neighborhoods that were already over-policed relative to wealthier and white neighborhoods. And then that data feeds back into the next iteration of the predictive policing algorithm, right? So these feedback loops happen all the time. So distortion is dangerous, but it's also sometimes useful. That's why these little car mirrors we have are built deliberately with a distortion. Right, there's a, there's a good reason, there's a good safety reason for that. But we also do this, we put a little guardrail, we put a little warning. Objects in mirror are closer than they appear. The problem is we don't have these warnings and we don't have these guardrails for our distorted AI mirrors. And that's one of the things that AI ethics tries to point out is the need to build these kinds of guardrails. Some other examples of these kinds of distortions and feedback loops, right? Um, when Midjourney was first released, um, it kept producing these weird looking women, super weird looking women. We, we all know they didn't have the right number of fingers, right? Um, but also way too many teeth, crazy amounts of teeth and like super, super skinny, super high cheekbones. And we know why this is, right? Because the training data is essentially over-representing models and other people who fit a certain image. Also, images of people who have used things like Instagram filters to change the way they look, and then that feeds into the training data for the AI system that then produces these images that then go back in the training data, right? So these distortions just keep circling around again and again, and it gets harder and harder to recognize what a real woman looks like. These images of synthetic people that don't look like us are filling up dating profiles, stock images, corporate photos, art, but they aren't us. They're a distorted phantom that optimizes our already unrealistic ideals. And now this is what increasingly real humans are asked to match. We've already seen this right with Instagram filters of young women and also young men even uh, pursuing dangerous and unnecessary cosmetic surgery so that they can look in real life more like the filters allow them to look online. So in this way, poor prediction and mirror distortion becomes imposed destiny. Mirrors also confound. Glass mirrors have always been a helpful tool of both the magician and the charlatan. Their power to produce an illusion is both entertainment and weapon. And today's AI mirrors are both as well. But again, their scale, speed, proliferation, and new ease of use and open source accessibility offers a step change in the human power to not only entertain one another, but also to deceive and manipulate one another. And this is where all the familiar worries about disinformation and misinformation being perpetuated by AI mirrors comes forward. We all remember Balenciaga Pope, right? This was fun. This was entertaining. I enjoyed it a lot. So did Chrissy Teigen. She says, I thought the Pope's puffer jacket was real and didn't give it a second thought. No way am I surviving the future of technology. OK, so this is funny. But there's a dark side of this, right? AI mirrors will soon be good enough to avoid some of the detectable signs. Uh, by the way, if you looked at this hard enough, you saw the chain from which the Pope's cross is hanging. You can only, it only has one side, right? The, the other side of the chain is missing. So that artifact is the tip off, right? That it's an AI generated image, but it's very easy a trivial issue to gradually filter out those kinds of tells. And there are very real applications of this kind of deception uh, that, uh, that ought to worry us all. Already, your elderly mother, some of you are so young, your mother is not yet elderly. She's my age. I refuse to say I am elderly. But still, let's, let's set that aside for a moment. 
your mother or grandmother can already receive, or your brother or sister, right? Doesn't have to be an old person. Anyone in your family can receive a phone call in your voice using your unique speaking cadence, if you've ever spoken online and been recorded, right? Using your unique speaking cadence and your word choices, asking for her to make a rapid wire transfer to bail you out of jail or cover a medical emergency in a foreign country. And soon that plea on the phone can come with a deep fake video of you bleeding and in tears. I've already created a code word for my mother because she will absolutely be a sucker for this, right? I've created a code word and told her, do not ever send money or anything or respond to something that doesn't use this code word to verify that she's speaking to me. Now imagine needing this for every single conversation you have over a mobile phone or over another internet channel. Every conversation with a friend, every conversation with a partner, every conversation with your child, every conversation with your employer. Many of, us, many, many of us already have to do this with email spam, right? How often do you get emails? Those of you who've um, uh, not moved into the workforce yet haven't seen this, but uh, you'll constantly get emails uh, from your boss asking you to urgently help them out with something and it's not your boss. So then you have to actually call your boss if you have their phone number and say, did you send this? All right, so what's the cost that we pay in society for this kind of world and what do we get in return? And again, I think we have to come back to this issue of the kinds of larger deceptions that all of us are subject to it's important that we don't excuse ourselves as people familiar with this technology and say, well, it's only the gullible, it's only the people who haven't been educated about these tools that will make mistakes or that will misinterpret what they're seeing, right? Blake Lemoyne understands this technology better than 99.9% .9 of the people on the planet. And he was still convinced that Lambda was a sentient, conscious being in, turn, in need of rights. So it's important that we don't get cocky and imagine that we ourselves are immune to these illusions. Mirrors also occlude. That is, they, they don't just reveal, magnify, distort, and confound, they hide, they block our view of things. So when we see ourselves reflected back in the AI mirror, what are we not seeing? What are those images hiding? Consider, for example, that the images do not reveal the people behind them who did all of the grueling work to make them safe for us. Think about all the humans who are erased by the AI mirror, even as those humans work for $2 an hour in Kenya to polish the surface of these mirrors. Those people, as have been widely reported, have been asked to sanitize the images in these mirrors from things like child sexual abuse, animal torture, murder, forced to watch these things on an endless loop in order to take them out of our sight. And those people are then being asked not only to erase the evidence of our sins while leaving the sins themselves untouched, but being viciously exploited by us in the process. Those people don't get to be reflected in the AI mirror. They only get to clean it. And that's an injustice that is very easy to ignore. But the kind of suffering we're talking about, we're talking about people who have killed themselves. We're talking about people who will never be whole again because of what they've been forced to watch and forced to see on behalf of those of us who build and enjoy these mirrors. Mirrors also flatten. So my body in the glass mirror is not a second body. It's not a body at all. It has no depth, no softness, 
no warmth, no smell, no pain, no comfort. And that's fine. I don't expect my body in the mirror to be a real body. But it is possible to forget that what I'm seeing in the AI mirror leaves out a lot of my personhood as well. And to accept the sort of mirror ghost, which asks less of us and less from us than the living, breathing thing itself. Think about all of the apps that will now happily set you up uh, with an AI mirror girlfriend or boyfriend, right? Who won't ask more of you than you want to be asked that won't make you uncomfortable with their own needs and demands, or at least not in ways you can't fix with a push of a button or a toggle of a filter. Or the ways we talk about empathic AI, as if empathy is something that we can actually put into these mirrors, right? So we're, we're reducing the meaning of terms like empathy or terms like love by embedding them in these mirror images. Today, you can read poems, songs, and novels written by a machine that has a powerful way with words, but not a thing inside waiting, bursting to be spoken. You can get mental health care from an artificial chatbot that hasn't known a single moment of doubt or despair. You can view art from a thing that hasn't ever had a breath to be taken away by beauty. But that's not the bad part. Like that would be fine, as long as we could tell the difference. The bad part is that increasingly, we speak in ways that elide these differences. I see you had your hand up. I'll come to you first in the queue. So Jeffrey Hinton talks about how reinforcement learning by human feedback is just parenting for a supernaturally precocious child. Okay, he's speaking loosely, fine. But actually, if you read the comments under that tweet, there's all sorts of people basically asserting that this is literally true, that there is no difference. So what happens when we lower our estimation of human parenting to allow the mathematical properties of a mirror to clear the bar? And the final thing these mirrors do is show us the past, right? Just like telescope mirrors, they reflect moments that are already gone by the time we see them. But the difference is practically neg negligible to us at this distance, right? So AI mirrors bring a longer stretch of the future, sorry, of the past forward. So if you ask AI mirrors what a CEO looks like, looks like this. No surprise, there's no women. If you ask what an artist looks like, it's this. Look, look at these images if you can see them at all. Most of them are like 17th and 18th century European male painters. Is that what an artist looks like today? So these tools are being sold to us as promises of innovation of imagination, but these aren't prediction. This is the past eating the future. Okay. I'm gonna wrap up now and I'm going to end on a positive note. I'm gonna sort of skip a little bit on the existential risk part and come back to this uh, if, we have, if we have time. I want to close by asking what else mirrors can be besides the things that I've described here. There's a virtue called prudence, uh, practical wisdom in ancient Greek, right? Phronesis. And in depictions of this virtue uh, in classical and uh, medieval times, a prudence carries a mirror. Why? Well, think about what mirrors do. They allow us to see ourselves. We know that self-knowledge is essential for wisdom, but they also allow us to see the past. Prudence is usually looking in the mirror and it's pointed behind her. We often need to understand the past and its patterns in order to walk more wisely forward. And there are ways we can use AI as tools of liberation to bring the past forward as a thing to push off from 
not something to replicate. Tools of justice to reveal those unjust bonds we have yet to shatter, like that knee pain algorithm, right? To show us the moral and political debts that are still unpaid. And we can use AI tools even as tools of love and solidarity by magnifying what is most worth cherishing and protecting in the human person and by amplifying our power to care for the world and one another. The true soul of technology, what technology does for people is the gift of a future. Technologies are tools to help one another to survive, to shield ourselves and one another from harm, to repair, to heal, to educate, to train, to feed, nurture, and comfort. These are what technologies were. AI can be remade for a humane future. It can be reconceived as a tool for these ends, not simply engines of war and profit, if we choose, if we demand. Thank you.